Good morning. I enjoy the rain after looking at a text I got from a former church member, and she showed me a picture of all the snow that had been falling since last night. And when I saw that, I thought, I can take a little drizzle. It'll work well. Good morning. Good to see you. I'm thankful that you are here. And you didn't melt, even by getting here. So that's a blessing to us. We're going to begin with Joel sharing prayer requests and mission updates. Let me give a, a couple of announcements, and these are actually related mostly to our um, missionaries and, and prayer requests, too. Uh, the pastoral search team, uh, the pastoral search committee, will meet uh, next Saturday. We continue in our efforts there. Uh, we met in person last Saturday. It was a great time of uh, fellowship and um, updates. We had kind of taken about a month and a half, almost two months, no, a month and a half to, um, for the holidays, and... Um, and uh, it was good to have uh, Mr. Freeman with us as well during that time. So we will be meeting uh, next Saturday um, in person once more. The Peavies will be with us next Sunday. Uh, they're, they're staying with, with uh, my family, uh, and we are really excited to have them. They'll be here for Sunday school. Be, the Sunday school team or meet, uh, groups will meet in this room, and then the missions team will share a meal with them after the service. Um, <coughs> Let me share the, the missions uh, letter, and this is from uh, Jeff and Beth McIntyre, and uh, they, uh, this is right around the, the new year, so uh, as we get towards the end of the month, I'm sure we'll see another update at, uh, eventually. The, issues, the issue of Light in the Hills actually came out right before uh, Christmas, so we decided rather than having it get lost in the shuffle, we would wait until after the holidays and send it with our 2023 prayer guide. There's a lot of information for you to read in addition to a great way to pray for us. The prayer guide also has a list of all of our activities over the next year, and there's a lot going on. We are going to two missions conferences in the next uh, few weeks to represent Scripture Memory Mountain Mission and recruit for the mission. The week between the conferences, we'll be, talking, we'll be taking excuse me, two online training courses to enable us to get our, members, our, our member care program up and running. We are excited to be able to put our new position into action. Our campus has much work to be done getting buildings fixed and grounds back in shape after the flood. We are also trying to get the displaced families living on campus into permanent housing. To accomplish this, we have many work teams on the docket. We are so thankful for their willingness to help us. There is no way we would be able to get all of this done before camp without their help. In addition, we have a full activity schedule this spring. So it will be a very busy time for us. It's exciting to see the campus active with ministry again and the various committees trying some new ventures and different avenues of ministry. Thanks again for the part you play in all of this with your faithful support for us. Jeff and Beth McIntyre. Uh, also, let me share a few uh, other prayer requests. Uh, as always, remember that you can grab one of the... Uh, um, uh, reminder sheets, one of the prayer sheets to take home with you to, to uh, pray and encourage you to pray during your your um, your devotional times and remember each other in prayer throughout the week. Uh, we're continuing to pray for Karen Norps and her recovery after uh, the, the fall and and, uh, and dealing with just the pain of all of that. Um, and we are praying for Chuck McGee who is uh, will be facing a bone marrow biopsy soon. Um, we're praying for Shirley Dean, and as she continues to improve, it's good to see her. It's good to have both of you with us. Uh, we are continuing to pray for both of you, um, and uh, and and others who are who, who we know are um, facing difficult times, who are um, you know don't get to see their 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 family members and are worried about their health. And uh, we continue to pray for for Leon. We continue to pray for Linda. Uh, it's, we are thankful that w Winnell uh, had a good report from her doctor, and that's always a, uh, a good thing, right? You, you can leave the doctor and walk away with, with joy and, and comfort, right? And not uh, be worried about anything. So we're very grateful for that and praising the Lord. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer and uh, dedicate this, these requests and this time to Him. Father, we are so grateful that we can be here, grateful to be among this fellowship of believers. Lord, I pray that you would... 
Touch our hearts today as we as we hear your word preached and as we praise you through song, Lord. Lord, we lift up these requests to you, knowing that you are always in control of every detail, every situation, uh, even those things that just seem out of control, those things that, that pop up without any uh, indication, without any warning, and Lord, that, that cause us to, to fret and stress and worry, Lord, and they are still under your control. You, have, you knew they were coming. You have a plan in place, Lord. It's I don't know how we could how anyone lives without knowing that there is a God in control in their lives, Lord. We we submit our lives to you, we submit our plans to you, our futures to you, our health to you, Lord. All of it is in your control, and that gives us such such a great amount of peace and rest and assurance, Lord, and in you. Thank you that you are uh, a God that, that cares, that loves, that pays attention, that nothing escapes. Uh, your sight and your, 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 your purview, Lord, your sovereignty uh, is worthy of praise. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Lord, we pray for the, uh, the, um, for the McIntyres and the ministries at, at uh, Camp Nathaniel and, and the mission, and, and well, their new roles in the mission at Scripture Memory Mountain Mission. Lord, we pray that they would uh, find themselves, you know, in, in a position that they enjoy, that they are able to use their talents, Lord, that you have you have brought them to this position to, to fulfill uh, many needs in, in, in Scripture Memory Mountain Mission. And Lord, that you would help all these work teams be able to arrive on time and, and do the work that needs to be done so that the campers can come back into their cabins and in the facilities and be uh, and the things be nice and safe. And, uh, and Lord, that uh, they'd be able to have a, a great time of, of ministry this spring and this summer with their students. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with their health. We pray for Chuck McGee, and we pray for uh, Daryl and Shirley. And Lord, we, we are so grateful for uh, the, the recovery, and we pray that that would continue to go quickly. We pray for Karen, and Lord, as she recovers and deals with the, the pain of, of, of that fall, Lord, we pray that uh, all would be resolved, Lord, and even, even as it takes time, Lord, that she would learn the, you know, how to move about and how to get about and and Lord, I pray for the, her encouragement as well, as that can be can be difficult to be to feel stuck. And uh, Lord, thankful for for Tom and obviously his help as as he cares for her in that way. Lord, uh, we pray for Leon and Linda, Lord, and, and their situation. And we pray for encouragement for both of them and the doctors as they care for Linda. And Lord, we just pray that you would encourage both their hearts. Father, thank you for this time that we we can have that we look forward to. Thank you for the the PVs that are coming. Thank you for the pastoral search team, Lord, and all these things that are coming in the future that we can rejoice in, that we are excited about and looking forward to. Lord, we pray for this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So this morning, in many congregations across the country, this Sunday has been given a special name. The name it has been given is Sanctity of Life Sunday. And when you consider the topic of the sanctity of life, there are, there are many things, actually, that, that fall under that. Um, we think, of course, immediately of the unborn and the scourge of abortion that we have in our country. But we must also consider our, our aging population and the concepts of euthanasia, um, the, also the concept or the, the, the racial uh, opinions and issues that people have. We are all created in God's image. We are created in God's image at the point of conception to the point that God decides to take us home because it is in God's hands that the question of live a life should be. And while all three of those things are important as we think of sanctity of life, and we as believers should champion the idea of sanctity of life, this morning we focus on the unborn. We focus on the issue of abortion. And as believers, we should be speaking the truth. We should be speaking biblically about protecting the lives of the unborn. And folks, you may be sitting here thinking, well, this doesn't really affect me. I'm, I'm not having children anymore, or I don't know anybody that has children or is having children. And we all know people have children. Sorry, I didn't mean that. But, you know, the word that you speak of truth, of, when you speak God's words, they do not return void. And so as you have opportunities 
to speak to people, to share God's truth, the word, the truth of God's word with them on these topics, we should take those opportunities. This morning, we are in a nation where Roe v. Wade has been overturned. That's excellent, but there's still more to be done. And so this morning, we share this video to help us, to help remind us the importance of the lives of the unborn and what we might be able to do through prayer and even action to help in that situation. Could we have the light, all of the lights on too? Since they'll come on quickly, could we turn those off just for ease of the viewing? Thank you, Daryl. I'm Dr. Bill Lyle and I practice obstetrics and gynecology and over the years I have delivered over 4,000 babies. Welcome today because today is special because this is the first Sanctity of Human Life Sunday since the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Since 1973, we have lost over 60 3 million babies' lives because of abortion. And abortion at its very core is an attack against the image of God. Genesis 1:26 says, after God created all the heavens and the earth, all the mammals, all the birds, and everything on this planet, God paused and he said, let us make man in our image. And that is all of us. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, and we were all created in the image of God. And we weren't created in the image of God on the day we were born. We were created in the image of God at that moment of conception. When we look at 63 million lives, that is doing evil in the sight of the Lord, destroying the image of God. And this is what the attack is. It's an attack against the image of God out of hatred for God Himself. We look at Psalm 139 where we are miraculously knit together in our mother's womb. The psalmist didn't understand about cell differentiation and fetal development. He just knew that it was knit together in our mother's womb. From the moment of conception when one cell from the mom and one cell from the dad get together, at that moment that is a unique new person. Unique from the mom, unique from the dad, unique from the other eight billion people on the planet. And then we go from one cell to two cells, to four, eight, 16, 32, 64, developing into different systems, cardiovascular system, neurological system, skeletal systems. 18 days after conception, we can actually see the heart beating. And the heart is pumping blood from the baby to the placenta where the mom is, and then back. And the babies not only have different genetics, but often the babies can even have a different blood type. It's really a matter of not just a choice, it is a matter of patient's rights and being created in the image of God. You say, well, why patient's rights? Because we treat the babies in the womb as patients. Because moms and babies can often have different blood types, sometimes moms will have antibodies which can cross the placenta and attack the baby's blood, and the baby's blood count starts to drop. If we don't do something, the baby's blood count will drop so low that the baby will go into the heart failure and the baby will die. So what do we do? We actually can now do blood transfusions directly into the circulation of the baby and we have done that as early as 18 weeks gestation. If we can give a baby a blood transfusion, then they are a patient and a patient has rights. But we're not just doing blood transfusions, we're doing surgery on babies in the womb. We are doing correction of spina bifida in the womb and we are saving babies' lives. And recently at the Cleveland Clinic, they actually performed an open heart surgery on the baby in the womb. The baby was diagnosed with a tumor called a teratoma, a tumor that was about half the size of the baby's heart and it was interrupting the blood flow from the baby. So what did they decide? They said, well, we can deliver the baby and then do surgery, but now we have a preemie which has just had surgery, or we can do surgery on the baby in the womb. They made the decision to operate on the baby in the womb. The mom got an epidural, so mom was in control of her pain. And then they made an incision in the mom's belly, they made an incision in the womb, and then they had access to the baby. So they brought out the baby's right arm, and they brought out the baby's left arm to get access to the baby's chest. And don't forget, 
This baby is only 27 weeks gestation. But before they did the surgery on the baby's heart, they actually started an IV in the baby's hand. So a pediatric anesthesiologist was caring for the baby and had the baby comfortable, and then the pediatric cardiologist then did the surgery. They made an incision in the baby's chest, they got access to the heart, and then they actually removed this tumor from the heart, and almost immediately, the baby's heart was pumping normally. And once that baby's heart was pumping normally, they closed the baby's chest, and then they put the arms back on the inside, they removed the IV, they closed the womb, they closed the mom's skin, and then they delivered that baby 10 weeks later at 37 weeks gestation. If we can do open heart surgery on a baby in the womb, then they are a patient, and a patient is a person, no matter how small. It wasn't too long ago where all abortions in the United States were performed surgically. But then even before COVID, 39% of all the abortions in the United States were performed with the abortion pill. And since COVID has now ended, at least 54% of all the abortions in the United States are performed with the abortion pill. Abortion pill is available telemedicine, it's available mail order, it's available on our college campuses coast to coast. Well, how does it work and how does the abortion pill differ from the morning after pill? The morning after pill is indicated for the morning after a woman has had intercourse. The abortion pill should be called the 70 mornings after pill because it's indicated for up to 70 days, 10 weeks. 98% of the time the abortion pill will kill a baby in the womb up to 10 weeks gestation. How does it work? When a woman becomes pregnant, amazing changes happen, and one of those changes is a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone stands for progestational steroid hormone. It's, it's the coach of pregnancy that keeps the pregnancy going. It says, you know what, we're not gonna have a menstrual cycle, we're gonna allow the uterus to relax, we're gonna divert more blood and nutrition because our new full-time job is supporting this pregnancy. The abortion pill, blocks the effect of the progesterone. And if you block the, the effect of the progesterone, there's no direction and the body is not gonna support the pregnancy and it withdraws all support and the baby dies. And then you take more pills the next day to cause you to have contractions. Well, is there an antidote for the abortion pill? When somebody realizes I made a bad choice, there is, and that hormone is called progesterone. The abortion pill lowers the level of progesterone. We just supplement and bring it back up. We're just reversing the effect of the abortion pill. We are 70% effective if we can intervene within the first 72 hours after a woman recognizes, I made a mistake. I made a bad choice and we can help them. We have a team of over 500 doctors that we have trained from coast to coast. We have nurses that are available at our hotline up in Columbus, Ohio. And this January, this month, we will document successful reversal number 4,000. I have attempted reversal 16 times here in my town and I've been successful 12 out of those 16 times. I mean, I've had a great career. 4,000 babies, I've delivered triplets and I've delivered quadruplets, but the ones that I really remember will always be the ones where you had a baby on the inside of the womb, eight, nine, 10 weeks along, mom made a bad choice. She made that choice, she took the abortion pill, but then she realized she made a bad choice. She contacted us and we were able to successfully reverse that. Healthy moms and healthy babies, that is amazing because that is the message of redemption, of buying back. The battle of abortion is not just something for outside of the church. Surveys will show that within the church, between 18 and 24% of the people within the church have personally been involved in an abortion. And there is pain. And what is the solution? Well, we need healing. And healing comes from forgiveness. And true forgiveness only comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a spiritual battle. We've all made decisions that we regret. We all have done things that we regret. So when we have so many people that have been personally involved with abortion, we must have them realize that that can be forgiven. That is what the healing is through the gospel. It is the gospel that changes hearts, minds, and behavior, and it's the gospel that is gonna produce that healing. This is where the church needs to be engaged. This is a spiritual battle. We might not have been engaged enough in 1973, but we have been given an amazing opportunity now since the reversal of Roe versus Wade. And I really think that God is looking saying, 
you have this amazing opportunity. We have reversed Roe versus Wade. What is the church going to do to defend my preborn, to discuss the gift of salvation and forgiveness and to provide healing for not only the church, but those outside of the church? Because if the truth is not gonna be heard from our pulpits, where do we expect to hear the truth? So the church needs to engage and the church doesn't just need to know the truth, the church needs to speak the truth. They need to stand up for the preborn. They need to say this is wrong, but they also need to discuss about forgiveness and healing. We are going to be developing a new curriculum in the next month. That will be a six week program for the church specifically to engage in the knowledge, not just of the science, not just of the medicine and the way we treat the preborn, but in the spiritual aspects of how we can and we must win this battle because we need to combat against something that is truly doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And people say, well, you know what? I'd had, I can't help with a pregnancy center because I made some bad choices and I had an abortion in the past. Remember what Paul said, forget about those things which lie behind and press on towards what's ahead. So thank the leader of your church for getting a video like this for Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. See how you can get engaged in your local pregnancy resource center. And if you have any questions, you can contact me, Dr. Bill Lyle, through our website, which is prolifedoc.org. God bless you, and thank you for setting aside Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Praise God for how He has gifted mankind in the knowledge of science and of medicine to be able to do some of those things that we just witnessed. Praise God that we are able to take care of things like that in the womb. But more importantly, praise God that we have the truth of God's word so that we can share the truth of God's word. As the doctor just was saying, this is a spiritual battle. Is it important that we stand up for the unborn? Absolutely it is. But it's even more important that we share the love of Christ, that we share the gospel, because that is what changes hearts. That is what changes minds. And so pray for, the, pray for all of the men and women that are involved right now in struggling with this decision. Pray for the local pregnancy resource centers. Mom has been involved in working with some um, over the years that do great work in counseling men and women who are involved in these situations. Pray for those workers. Pray for doctors that abortion will become unthinkable in the United States. Pray that the abortion pill will be removed from the table, that it won't even be available in the United States. We need to pray that the Lord will turn those away who are thinking of killing the children. And praise God that we have the opportunity to share the truth of God's word with the world around us. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this day as we set aside time to, to recognize the, the problem that we have in our country. To recognize that it is important that we stand up for those who have no voice. And Lord, each one of us knows the truth of God's word. I pray that we would speak that truth. That it is not our own, it is yours. And help us to share the gospel because we know that those who trust you and truly trust in Christ as their Savior are redeemed by you and have the Holy Spirit guiding and directing them. And so we pray for doctors and nurses that are involved in this, that you would turn them to you or they would not make those choices anymore. That for men and women who are, are struggling with that would seek out good godly counsel. We pray that you would help each of us to truly speak the truth of the gospel when you give us that opportunity. We thank you for your word. Thank you for gifting mankind through medicine and science to be able to do some of these things. We give you the honor and the glory and the praise for that, Lord. And now as we enter in a time of worship, we pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified as we sing your praises. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Dave, thanks for finding that video. That was powerful. I had no idea that could be done. The title I've given this morning is Super Single 
or dynamic duo. Whenever I read 1 Corinthians, I am reminded of a young child at camp for the first time in his life. He wrote to his mother, and the letter went something like this. Dear Mom, I told you that something terrible would happen if I went off to camp. Well, it did. Love, Joe. <laughs> kind of like this letter. And this letter is a response to communication that came from believers in Corinth asking Paul to clarify certain situations. When Paul got their communication, he might have been gripped with the same uneasy feelings that this mother had. Children of faith came to Christ because of Paul, and he loved them and he cared for them and he wanted only the best in their life. We see at the beginning of chapter 7, now concerning the things about which you wrote. Paul's opening phrase in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians reminds us that this Corinthian correspondence was intensely personal. It was a letter about specific difficulties that were disrupting the fellowship of a particular church, and they were asking Paul for advice. Yet terrible things were happening to them. Problems were erupting on every hand. Confusion was leading to division. They needed help, so they wrote to Paul for advice about this problem. And one of the problems disturbing them had to do with the choice between remaining single or getting married. The Corinthian Christians were in a predicament. More immorality was rampant in Corinth. And what was worse is that immorality was incorporated into the worship of other religions in the city. There were a thousand sacred prostitutes that served in the temple where Aphrodite was worshipped. As a result, sexual immorality permeated the cultural fabric of the city. The relationship between men and women uh, was being perverted. In reaction to this, many Christians had moved to the opposite extreme. They concluded it was better not to be married at all, or if married, to avoid the sexual part of that relationship. They were caught in the middle of two extremes. The majority of Christians at Corinth were confused. What should they do? Was it really a sin to get married? Or was it a sin to remain single? In answer to these questions, Paul wrote chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. And Paul has made some problematic statements that can be understood only if we remember that everything Paul wrote was colored by his expectation of the imminent return of Jesus Christ and by his understanding of the immoral behavior of the Corinthians. We're not going to eliminate all of these perplexities, but instead... I'd like to examine a couple of vital insights in this chapter that are very relevant to us today. Let's pray. Father, we ask God that we will set aside concerns and cares and worries of this life and focus wholly upon the Word of God. Father, we pray that this passage will impact us in such a way that we'll be able to more deeply understand your word, especially in chapter 7. Blessed Father, as we study in Jesus' name, amen. We just have two points this morning to share. 
First of all, the super single. Paul wrote to the Corinthians that it is possible to be satisfied as a single. That is the first truth of this text. In fact, in some cases, it's even better if someone remains single. In verse 1, Paul stated, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now this is probably a direct quote from the letter that the Corinthians sent to Paul. But Paul nevertheless supports his idea in other places. In verse 1, it is better, I'm sorry, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. In verse 7, Paul adds, Yet I wish that all men were even as, my, as myself is. That means single. Paul is wishing that all men were that way. We'll understand why in a minute. Verse 8, But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them to, if they remain even as I. In verse 25 and 26, now concerning the unmarried, I think that in view of the present distress, that is good for a man to remain as he is. Look at verse 40. He spoke to widows, saying, But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as he is. Verse 32 and 33. Paul declared, but I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and his interests are divided. Now I say this for my own benefit, for your own benefit, Paul says. We need to have an undistra undistracted devotion to the Lord. Paul is saying that single life is totally okay. And sadly, I have known of young men and young women that have been pressured into marriage when they chose the wrong person or at the wrong time or at the wrong way. It is okay to remain single. It's not something to apologize about. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's okay. It is possible to be single and be satisfied and to be serving the Lord. I think if we have an opportunity, we need to affirm the worth of that single person our worth should not be derived from the person to whom we are married. Our worth should not be found in the children that God gave us. Our worth should not be found in any of these things but the relationship we have with God and the kind of person we are becoming as we serve the Lord. Single or married, each of us can look at ourselves in the mirror every morning and should be able to say, I'm okay. The context of the chapter so far is colored by what Paul says. Number one, because of the shortness of time. We don't need to have our attention diverted from God's work because God could come back at any moment. But in every age, in every circumstance, this unchanging principle comes through. Being single is not a disease, or a disaster, or a disgrace, but a viable lifestyle for any Christian. Patty and I knew a, a woman not a lot of years ago that was absolutely vexed because she hadn't been married, couldn't find a husband, 
didn't have children, and it just ruined their whole perspective about life. How sad it is to be that way. Now remember, Paul's concern and words are to be understood in the context of the terrible immorality that was permeating all of society and the imminent return of Jesus Christ. You can be a super single and serve the Lord well. Go for it. Second point we see in Paul's passage is the dynamic duo. In the second message of this chapter, it says that marriage is good as well. Being satisfied as a single is a viable option for the Christian, but so is being part of a dynamic duo in marriage. Paul is not minimizing marriage, though he was single. Because of the times, he recommended singleness. However, he quickly added that if being single is a disadvantage, a Christian should get married. And if a Christian is married, he's not committing a sin, he writes to Corinth. It's okay to be married. But remember, it is better to be single than to marry the wrong person. Over my years as pastor, I have seen many heartbreaking situations where either men or women or women chose the wrong person, went ahead with marriage, and though they were a believer in Jesus Christ, they divorced because they didn't use the wisdom of the Word of God in choosing a right spouse. It's better to be single than to marry the wrong person. Now there's an extra twist that we see here as well. If a Christian chooses to be married, Paul says, he or she has to accept the responsibilities of marriage. Many times, whether male or female, Patty and I have come in contact with people that want to be married, but they want to do their own thing. They want to be married, but I've got my own checkbook. They want to be married, but I'll make my own decisions. If we get married, we must choose to accept the responsibilities of marriage. Look in chapter 7 at verse 3. Paul declared, let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise the duty to her husband. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is dealing in this passage primarily with the se sexual aspect. But in addition to that, Men are responsible as husbands to care for the wife. And the wife is responsible to care for her husband. And we must not cut short the idea of being one in Christ. Verse 5 warns, stop depriving one another. Remember, for men and for women, you didn't marry a slave. You didn't marry a butler. You married your spouse. And God has called you to fulfill your duties and responsibilities as a husband leader and as a wife helper in every situation. In verse 10 through 11 and also in verse 39, Paul urged the Christians who were married to stay together. Stay together. Make it work. Go through the tough times. Don't throw in the towel. Marriage is a live option for the Christian. And when we decide to get married, we should seek to make it the best relationship it can possibly be. Remember, and give this as counsel to others, only marry a saved believer 
in Jesus Christ. Evangelistic dating is dangerous. Don't do it. I could list many stories of heartache that have resulted from marrying an unbeliever. Second point I want to remind you of is marry before you have relations. What? Isn't that old fashioned? Isn't the way it was in the older days? Not really. God's word says we are not to touch a woman or a man until marriage. Wait, it is worth it. Third point, marry before you live together. And I know we are a small minority of people and young people that don't even understand the concept of what I'm telling you. But God's word has told us already marriage that is permanent, marriage that is solid. It should be a permanent relationship. Marriage should last. I use the length of the marriage that Patty and I have as an opening door to share the gospel and to talk to a waiter or a waitress about Jesus Christ. And when I tell them that we have been married for 57 years, they look at you like you're from another planet. They say, I've never heard of that before. I remember my great grandparents were married that long. But we don't see that today. One man recently wrote, without the sacrament of divorce, who would be silly enough to get married? That's how the world thinks. That's how people in churches sometimes think. And it's an idea that is wide, widespread. Many people today not just younger ones. Think of marriage as something to enter into unadvisedly and leave whenever the going gets tough. Pastor, she, she burned my eggs. I'm out of here. Or she might say, he went out and bought a car and didn't even ask me. I'm heartbroken. Listen to this. There was an article in the Dallas Morning News recently and it used the term starter marriages. Have you heard that before? Starter marriages. It seems to describe the first marriage as a test drive, or the first marriage as a throwaway. I think a lot of times we today in our society, as well as in Christian circles, have forgotten that the privileges of marriage carry with them accompanying responsibilities. That the freedom to share in the life of another person also places obligations on our lives. Let's be honest. Sometimes married life is tough. Marriage is not, all, not always moonlight and roses. Sometimes it's daylight and dishes and dirty diapers and disobedient children and thoughtless husbands and grouchy wives. Sometimes marriage is tough. It's not always easy. But we are to do everything within our power and trust the Lord to make it last. Marriage is a permanent relationship. Not only is it a permanent relationship, but secondly, it should be a providing relationship. Paul moved marriage from the level of self-gratification. It's all about me. It's what I want. Just do what will make me happy. From self-gratification to the level of sensitivity. The proper attitude for marriage is not what can I get, but rather what can I give. We've told people in premarital counseling and other places, marriage is not a 50-50 proposition. Marriage 
is 100% for me and zero for Patty. Marriage is 100% for Patty and zero for me. Patty and I were sharing with a, a lady that manages one of those big stores that this one does over $100 million of business every year. And we were talking about different things, one of them being marriage, which she brought up. Now she's a believer, but she had never heard the idea between she and her husband that she is responsible 100% of the time to be what God would have her to be. And he is responsible 100% of the time to be what he ought to be. It's not 50-50, it's 100-0. Marriage is not a relationship of convenience, it's a relationship in which we can meet the needs of the other person through mutual meeting of needs experienced together, which results in deep peace in our lives. In different counseling experiences, when the wife got done talking and the husband got talking, it sounded like they, they were in a warfare, and I think they were. And they weren't willing to give in. They weren't willing to take a back seat. They weren't willing to serve and to share with each other. I guess probably the biggest enemy to being a successful dynamic duo today is selfishness. It creeps in, doesn't it? Doesn't Satan just make you selfish before you even know you're there? If you don't get the right thing, if you don't have it at the right time, if she or he just doesn't come through with the goods, they had better in with the idea that marriage is to fulfill all of my needs and all of my dreams. We're entering into the, se the season of marriage and the bride's books are out on the table and the advertisement for the jewelry is coming across the airwaves and women are getting, not you that are married, getting in a Twitter about the whole idea. But they enter in in a magical mystery way without understanding what it is to be in the dynamic duo setting. Now in count contrast to self-centeredness, Paul reminds the Corinthian princi principles that marriage is to be a relationship in which we provide for the needs of our partner. And if you want to have fun, just provide for some of the wants. That makes it a special time together. Marriage should always be a permanent relationship, a providing relationship, and lastly, a permeating relationship. When Paul talked about an unbelieving husband being sanctified through the believing wife, he didn't mean that the husband will get saved simply because the wife does. He is simply suggesting that the faith of the believing partner should permeate the home with the Spirit of Christ, in which would provide the opportunity for the unbelieving partner to come to Jesus Christ. How we live makes all the difference in the marriage. It's pretty easy today, right here and right now, to all look mostly civilized. We're loving, we're kind, we're gentle, we're concerned, but what happens when you go home and close the front door? What happens when you get comfortable and the day goes back to normal after the service? Marriage is not a game. Marriage is one of the most sacred and yes, I will say most demanding privileges that anybody ever enters into. It's serious business. Paul says, it's great to remain a super single. Being single is not a disease or a disaster or a disgrace, but a viable lifestyle for any Christian. 
But if we choose to get married, we ought to make our marriages permanent, providing and permeating relationships. And through that, we can bring glory to God. You may be doing great. I'm thankful. You may need a tune-up, and this message has pricked your heart just a bit, and it's caused you to think about some things. How's your relationship with one another? How do you respond to one another? How quickly are you men to, to pick up the load and help your wife? And you ladies, the same for your husband. How good it is as a dynamic duo or a super single to serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful. You are a gracious and good God. You have provided for us forgiveness, salvation, the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we pray, Father, that whether married or single, we will pursue the truths that we find in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. Forgive us, Father, for past failures, because we all have them. But from this point on, help us, Lord, to honor you in Jesus' name.